Hello everyone, my name is Devendra Kapadia and in this talk Oliver Ruben Koenig and myself will give you some information about solving PDs or regions with symbolics and numerics in Mathematica. Now Oliver and I are both kernel developers here at Wolfram Research but we do slightly different things. Uh, I work on symbolic exact solutions of differential equations using dsolve while Oliver works on numerical solutions of PDs, particularly using NDSolve. In fact, Oliver is the developer of the very popular and powerful FEM, that is finite element method in Mathematica version 10. So uh, we will both try and give you some information about what's available in this area. And although we have different approaches, we'll choose examples which will show you how to set up a problem how to solve it, how to use the results for plotting and in your further calculations. So without further delay, let me give you an outline of today's talk. So I'll go first and I'll speak about symbolic solutions of classical and modern PDs. So when I say classical, I mean things like the wave equation, the heat equation and Laplace's equation. And then I'll also take up some more modern PDs, such as Berger's equation from fluid dynamics, the black shows equation from finance, and the Schrodinger equation from quantum mechanics to show what we can do in this area. And then in the second half of the talk, Oliver will speak about numerical solutions of PDs over regions. And now here the problem is quite geometrical because the region could be quite complicated and it's a hard enough task to set it up and then to solve it using the FEM method. And both of us, during our respective talks, will speak about eigenvalue problems for differential operators, which are kind of important, in fact, crucial for understanding the nature of solutions which you can obtain with dsolve and dsolve. OK, so now let me go on to my first slide, which is about the classical PDs. And I've taken up one example each to show you how you can work with the classical PDs. So I'll speak about vibrations of a stretch string using the wave equation, and then the flow of heat in an insulated bar with the heat equation, and then we'll solve the Dirichlet problem in a rectangle using Laplace's equation. Okay, so let's begin with the vibrations of a stretch string. And so here is the wave equation. The wave equation in its simplest form is just a relation between the second partial derivatives with respect to time and space. We have a string, uh, it's a mathematical string, so its length is pi, and we assume that the, the string is fixed at both the ends. That's the boundary condition for the PD. And now I must say what happens to the string, the string initially. So you have an initial condition, it's slightly asymmetrical, and then I give it a D sort to solve. Uh, it takes a bit of time because dsolve must decide whether the solution is elementary or requires more advanced techniques or even separation of variables. So in this case, in fact, you'll see it opts for the separation of variables and uh, it tries to get a kind of um, Fourier expansion for the solution of this problem. And that solution is then going to be an infinite sum. In fact, you can see it now. It's an inactive sum. The sum over here does not evaluate. So what I do is I use the activate symbol in Mathematica and take a few terms from this solution and see what we can do with it. So you can see over here that there are four terms and each term is in fact a solution of the wave equation. Now, the point is that these have got different names. They're called separation variables or they will be called standing waves, but what do we call them? The graph looks just the same. So you have your, the first four standing waves. And now the magic of Fourier analysis kicks in, and what you can do is you can animate the motion of the string, and there it goes up and down, where it hits the bottom, then it goes up. But of course you can do the same thing with the oscillations of a drum or any other periodic phenomenon. And in fact, the documentation has got some very nice examples for all this. OK, so that's the wave equation. And now I go to the second example, which is the heat equation. Now, the heat equation is very simple. 
it just says that the first partial with respect to t is equal to the second partial with respect to x. I have a bar which is insulated, so no heat must flow through both the ends. That's a boundary condition. And then I have an initial temperature for the bar. So in this case, it's 20 plus 80x. So when x is 0, the temperature is 20. When x is 1, the temperature is 100. So naturally, as time goes by, it's going to kind of average out to roughly 60. So when you solve the problem with desolve, it again tries various methods. But it comes back with an infinite sum, much like for the wave equation. You extract a few terms from the infinite sum. And what you see over here is that the first term is simply the steady state temperature for this system. And every other term is just a solution of the heat equation. And then if you plot those terms together, you see over here that the blue graph is the initial time. And then as time goes by, the temperature slowly settles to its steady state value at 60 degrees. So this kind of very simple example shows how heat works. It tends to stabilize as time goes by, and it does so very quickly. Another third classical PD, which is the Laplace equation. Now for the Laplace equation, you have simply the Laplace in equal to zero as the equation. I give a Dirichlet condition on the boundary. So I'm on a rectangle. I must tell you what happens on each boundary line. So that's the Dirichlet condition. You're in a rectangle of a certain type. And now with this very modern notation of regions, you can solve the problem with desolve. And again, what you get back is going to be an answer from the separation of variables. So what I do is I extract the first, in this case, 300. You didn't have to do that, but just let's take the, the first 300 terms. And then you plot the solution. And what you get is just the figure showing you the Dirichlet problem solution. Now, a few things to note over here, that the solution is nice and smooth, although the boundary conditions are sharp. The second point is that the maxima and minima occur on the boundary, as you'd expect for the Laplace equation. So this kind of problem illustrates exactly how you can work with the classical PDs and get some useful information about their solutions using Mathematica. I now go on to the more modern PDs. So uh, PDs have been around for a long time, but in the 20th century, they really took off due to several very important breakthroughs. So one problem is the problem of turbulence. Now, everyone who's anyone has worked on turbulence in fluids, but the problem is really hard. And around 1940, I believe, uh, GM Burgers decided that there was a very simple model which might replace the very hard Navier-Stokes equation. So J.M. Burgers said that this rather simple PD, it's still nonlinear. There's a nonlinear term over here. So it's nonlinear. But he thought that this might replace the Navier-Stokes equation as a good model for turbulence. Well, when you propose such a model, the last thing you would want is for someone to show you that your problem has an exact solution. And in fact, uh, around 10 years later, Hopf and Cole showed that this rather difficult nonlinear PD can be solved exactly by a transformation to the heat equation. So let's see how uh, I give an initial condition, which is kind of piecewise, like a unit step. And then I solve the problem. It's a pretty difficult integration. And I'm using desolve value, so you get the exact formula back rather than a rule. So when it's done, the solution is given in terms of the error function. And if you plot the solution, it looks nice and smooth. Well, that's clearly because we use the heat equation to solve the problem. And the heat equation has a kind of smoothing property. So the question is, what happens as you change the value of the viscosity, which I've called epsilon over here. Well, what happens is that as epsilon approaches 0, the Burgers equation develops a kind of shock 
discontinuity which is well known so when I let epsilon go to zero you can see over here that the smoothness slowly disappears and what you have finally is a kind of shock discontinuity which is typically very difficult to study even analytically. So with that kind of hint about turbulence and Burgos equation I'll now move on to my second example for this morning which is the Black-Scholes model from finance. So in the early 1970s Fisher Black and Martin Scholes proposed this partial differential equation, this PD, which you see over here, as a model for option prices in finance. Now, typically the problem is you have an option which is based on a certain asset, which is called S over here, and then what you want to know is the price of this option today, so it has a given value after a certain period of time. Now in their paper, Black and Scholes noted that this problem can be reduced to the heat equation and so that makes the problem wonderfully simple. This is a very famous paper, it's been quoted I believe 28,000 times by now but the solution of Black and Scholes is a model of simplicity and in fact that's why the formula is so useful. You can see the formula in front of you now and what we do now is we give some typical values to the parameters and you get back an option price as it's found out in finance. Now the question is what do all the parameters mean? What's S, what's K, what's Sigma, what's capital T and what's R? Well to understand that we call Mathematica's financial derivative function which tells you that what you have really is a European call option with a certain strike price, a certain expiration date etc and you see over here that what you get back is exactly the same value. So the Black-Scholes model has a closed form solution which is used quite a lot in practice at least for initial kind of guesses about option prices. And now my third example of a modern PD and that's the Schrodinger equation. So I'm going to model a quantum particle in a box, something like an electron, using the Schrodinger equation. So that's the Schrodinger equation. It's by far the most important PD of the 20th century, at least to me, because it governs the motion of tiny particles in atoms and underlies a lot of technology. So you are in a box of size D and you prescribe that the boundary condition is zero at both ends. I give some kind of initial state and then we solve the problem with dsolve. You get back a nice solution in terms of trig functions and exponentials. But then the question is what is the psi? Well the psi over here is the wave function and the wave function on its own is not very useful because it's a complex quantity. So Max Born taught us that in fact what you need is the probability density which is the absolute value basically of the wave function. So that's the probability density. We plug in some reasonable parameter values like the mass of the electron and when you then animate the solution what you see is that the electron sways back and forth left and right in this rather tiny box but this simple illustration captures what the Schrodinger equation is all about, namely it's about the motions of electrons and other particles inside a box or the atomic dimension structure. Okay, I'm now on to the final part of my talk which is to do with symbolic eigenvalue problems. In fact, one might ask, why did Schrodinger discover the equation? Well, very early on in his career, Schrodinger learned about eigenvalue problems from his teachers, and these eigenvalue problems are fairly simple differential equations, but they are pretty hard to solve. So here's an example of an eigenvalue problem. You see, you have the equation of y double prime plus lambda equal to zero. I mean, lambda is y equal to zero. Now, the problem is that the boundary conditions are really very simple. You like this function y to be 0 at both 0 and pi. 
And of course, there is a trivial solution, namely y equal to 0. And for many years, dsol would only give back this trivial solution. But in fact, there are many more. And to see what they are, let's just go ahead and evaluate this cell over here. So what you see over here is that the, the complete solution, in fact, depends upon the sine function. And you have a solution in terms of the sine function only for certain parameter values of lambda, namely when lambda is a perfect square of an integer. So here are the first five eigenfunctions, sine x, sine 2x, sine 3x, sine 4x, and sine 5x. And we can plot the eigenfunctions, and they look quite familiar from various situations. But this eigenvalue problem is something that is brand new to version 10.3, and we can solve these problems quite nicely now. To take a slightly harder problem, let's consider what we call a Robin problem. You see, the problem is that over here, you have the same differential equation essentially as before, but now there is a rather complicated condition at the left end. So when you give it a dsol, dsol can't quite find the eigenvalues in closed form. So what it does is it returns for you a kind of equation which determines the eigenvalues. And this equation is roughly tangent of lambda equal to lambda. So what you could do is, and that's what you do in a textbook, is to try and isolate the roots which lie between, let's say, 1 and 10. So here's a plot which tells you that, in fact, the roots probably are around 4.5 and 7 point something close to 8. So the question is, how do you get these values using dsol? Well, that puzzled us, but then we decided to introduce a new option called the assumptions option, which some of you know from other functions. So when you say assumptions 1 less than lambda less than 10, then what you get back is a solution which actually pinpoints the very same eigenvalues 4.49 and 7.72. But this is an exact solution given in terms of what we call transcendental root objects. So that's what you can do with dsol. You can solve some pretty difficult eigenvalue problems in closed form. And now my final example, which has to do with a kind of three-dimensional situation where you have a Laplacian in three dimensions. And let's say I'm working in a ball, so I prescribe that the function is zero on the boundary of the ball, the surface of the ball. We have a new function called d eigen system, which can then be used to work out a small number, a large number of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions for this operator, the Laplacian in the ball. So I use the eigen system and uh, it takes just a few seconds for this to complete typically. It's done now. And the question is, what do the eigenfunctions look like? Well, we have a very nice function called density plot 3D in version 10.2 actually, which can do this kind of visualization, but it takes a bit of time depending upon your machine. So when I let this run, then after a few minutes, it returns a beautiful picture which you'll see shortly and that's in this case the seventh eigenfunction for the Laplacian in a ball with the Richelieu conditions. So the eigen system can also find for you eigenvalues for many operators and together dsol and the eigen system have a very nice set of functionality which has been requested by many users over the years and now it's available to you in version 10.3. So that more or less concludes what I had to say. I just want to remark that the documentation for dsolve and the eigen system have got many more examples which you might want to look at. So do look over there. Uh, this is really a major breakthrough for us to have such strong support for PDs in Mathematica on the symbolic side, and we definitely want to know what else you'd like to see in a future version. But uh, for now, we feel we have really met many requests made by users over the year. So with those few words, I'll conclude with my presentation on symbolic.
solutions of PDs and Oliver will then speak about the numerical side but uh, there is some kind of synergy between the two of us we have tried to give roughly the same kind of problems and show you how you can solve them very beautifully using Mathematica. So thank you very much and I'll stop here. Let's discuss numeric PDE solving over regions. In Mathematica, you have the functions ndsolve and ndsolve value to compute solutions of differential equations. In this example here, I use ndsolve value to compute the solution of a Laplacian set equals to 10. This is a Poisson type of equation. The dependent variable is u and x and y are the spatial coordinates. Additionally, two boundary conditions are specified at y equals zero, the dependent variable is set to zero, and at y equals one, the dependent variable u is set to one. u, again, is the dependent variable, and the region is specified as x going from zero to one and y going from zero to one. And this of value will return an interpolating function. That interpolating function can be used in functions like plot3d to visualize the result. To solve PDEs, typically you need to specify three things. You need to specify the region, omega. Of course, you need a PDE that you'd like to solve. And thirdly, you need to specify boundary conditions that interact with the PDE and the boundary. Here's a second example. The region we'd like to solve the PDE over is a disk, omega. The operator is the negative Laplacian minus one, and we specify a Dirichlet boundary condition that says that the dependent variable u is supposed to be zero for all values of the region that x is larger than zero. Again, we call nd solve value, set the PD operator to zero, so give the Dirichlet boundary condition as an argument, u is a dependent variable, and the x and y are element of omega, which is the disk in this case. Again, and solve value will return an interpolating function, and we can again visualize that solution with plot 3D. Note that in this case, the region was not rectangular, was specified to be a disk. Let's discuss the specific PDEs that can be solved with ND solve or ND solve value. The coefficient form is the most generic PDE that can be solved. It has a first order time derivative and several different spatial derivatives. If one looks at specific equations, for example, the Laplace equation, then the coefficients that are active are highlighted in blue. In this case, in the Laplace case, C is set to one and F is set to zero. A Poisson type equation differs only in that the right-hand side F is not zero, but a specific value. The Helmholtz equation has an additional term plus AU, a convection reaction type equation has additional terms beta dot double u plus au. A heat equation is a time dependent version. A wave equation has a second order time derivative. And nd solve will convert higher order time derivatives to systems of first order PDEs. These coefficients c, alpha, beta, gamma, and a, f, can all depend on space and time. Let's look at the Poisson type of equation. In the picture below, you see a red and a blue boundary. We'll modify the specific PDE and the boundary conditions to first use two Dirichlet boundary conditions on the red and the blue boundary, and then a Dirichlet and a Neumann boundary condition. Let's set up the problem. First, we specify an implicit region that models the exact region we've seen just now. The operator is a negative Laplacian minus 20. And in this first example, we specify that the Dirichlet condition u, the dependent variable, is set to zero at x equals zero and y is between eight and 10. So that's the left and upper corner of the region we just saw. The second Dirichlet condition sets the dependent variable to 100 and is on the half circle set on the region. We then call nd solve value with the operator set to zero, the Dirichlet conditions, the dependent variable u and x and y element of omega and omega is the implicit region. We visualize the result 
UIF is the interpolating function returned by Andy Solve, and the solution is depicted below. Now, there's two types of boundary conditions that can be specified. Dirichlet boundary conditions and generalized Neumann boundary conditions. A Dirichlet condition sets a fixed value of the dependent variable on some part of the boundary. A generalized Neumann value sets a flux over an edge on some part of the boundary. The default, if no boundary condition is specified, is called a Neumann zero value. So not specifying any boundary conditions on some part of the boundary implicitly says that we want a Neumann zero value. Let's look at this problem again. This time, the upper left-hand corner is again the same Dirichlet boundary condition set to zero. The dependent variable is set to zero. But this time, the Neumann value on the semicircle is set to a value of minus two dependent times the dependent variable. And the solve will then compute the solution. And this time, we specify that the operator is exactly the same as a Neumann value and specify additionally the Dirichlet boundary condition. U is the dependent variable, X and Y are still part of that same omega as before. And the solution is depicted below. Let's look at the transient problem. Imagine a pipe. Inside the pipe, we have a hot liquid and outside we have room temperature. Now, additionally, in the pipe wall, there are cooling ducts to cool the pipe as such. The specific region that models a symmetrical part of that pipe is depicted below in blue, and the mathematical description is given as this implicit region. To model this, we use the negative Laplacian of the dependent variable u that now is also time dependent. We specify two Dirichlet conditions, one on the inside and one on the outside. At the inside, the dependent variable u is set to 200, and at the outside, the dependent variable u is set to 15 degrees. The Neumann value models the amount of energy that's absorbed by the cooling liquid. For times t smaller or equal to 10, the amount slowly grows until it reaches its maximum. Now, to solve this, we call nd solve value and specify these operators at time t equals zero. That will give us a suitable initial condition for the temporal problem. We then call nd solve with the time derivative of the dependent variable u plus the Laplacian operator and set that equal to the Neumann value and additionally specify the Dirichlet condition. These are time independent, so it doesn't matter at what time those are specified. Additionally, we also specify the initial condition at t equals zero. t goes from zero to 25 and x and y are part of the region specified above. Below, you see a visualization of how the cooling liquid affects the temperature distribution in the wall of the pipe. Here's the second visualization where the contour plot of the temperature distribution in the pipe is put back into the original region that I've shown at the start. Let's look at a wave equation. The wave equation has a second order time derivative of the dependent variable u. The special thing here is that the region is rather complicated. I have a rectangular boundary and some writing inside of that boundary. What you see a little further down here is the POV re rendering of a solution of the wave equation in that domain. The letters are a hard boundary and the wave reflects from that boundary. All of this has been computed with ND solve. Only the rendering has been done with POV ray. This usually takes about 50,000 elements and computes in about five minutes. The render time is around about five hours. Here is an animation of that wave equation problem in that specific region. ND solve can solve systems of n PDEs. In this example, I've chosen two PDEs with dependent variables u and v. The two equations 
are in principle exactly the same as the coefficient form given earlier, with the only difference that each of the equation depends on the two dependent variables u and v. This allows for cross-coupling between the different components in the PDEs and allows for a great variety of PDEs to be solved. The Dirichlet conditions now also depend on u and v, as do the Neumann values. As another example, let's look at Stokes flow. Stokes flow is a system of three coupled PDEs, and they're depicted below. We have u and v as velocity components and p as a pressure. The example we'd like to analyze now is a narrowing channel. On the left-hand side, depicted in red here, we have an inflow boundary condition that specifies the velocity in the u direction. The u direction is equivalent to the x direction. And on the right-hand side, we specify a pressure zero at the outflow. Let's start with the problem setup. First, we specify the region omega with an implicit region. Then we specify the PDE. Stokes flow is a function that's appended at the end of this notebook and will return the three PDEs that we've seen just before on the previous slide. U, V, and P are the dependent variables, where U and V are the X and Y velocity components, and P is the pressure. We set that to zero in all three dependent components. Thirdly, we specify the Dirichlet boundary conditions. The first Dirichlet condition is on the left-hand edge, the inflow condition, and it specifies that the velocity in the U direction is given by the formula shown. The second equation, the second Dirichlet condition, is that u and v are both set to be zero between the inflow and the outflow. So all boundary walls have a zero velocity component in u and v direction. And the last Dirichlet condition specifies the pressure at the outflow. P is set to zero here. To solve this, we call nd solve value with the specified PDE and the boundary conditions. U, V, and P are the dependent variables, and ND solve value will return three interpolating functions. X and Y are part of omega, the region we just specified. And additionally, we specify that the method to be used is a finite element method, and specify that the interpolation order for U and V, the two dependent variables, is second order, and the interpolation order for P, the pressure, is first order. That is a stabilization technique common in the finite element world. Lastly, there's a visualization of the velocity field of the inflow and the outflow part of the component. Let's look at the 3D structural mechanics problem. We have a graphics of a crankshaft. That crankshaft is held fixed at both ends and forces from the piston deform the object, the problem setup. We first use discretized graphics to convert the graphics into something that two element mesh then can generate an element mesh from. The mesh order is set to one, and this says that the approximation is first order accurate. This generates a mesh of 175,000 tetrahedra. You don't have to use two element mesh to generate the mesh, but you can. And in this case, I've just done this to illustrate you that it's possible to do it. Second, we set up the PDE and the boundary conditions. The stress operator is given at the end of the notebook. It takes Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, U, V, and W as dependent variables, and X, Y, and Z as the spatial coordinates. This will return a set of three coupled PDEs. The first two are set to zero, and the last one gets a Neumann value with a value of minus 1,000. This means that the force is pushing in the negative Z direction at the given positions. Thirdly, we give the Dirichlet conditions where we say that u, v, and w are set to zero. They are held fixed at both ends of the crankshaft. ND solve will then solve this PDE and boundary conditions in about six seconds on this specific laptop. The visualization shows the deformed crankshaft in red. In this section, we're going to discuss numeric eigenvalue problems. To solve numeric eigenvalue problems, you typically need two or three things. You need a PDE, a region specification, and sometimes boundary conditions. The PDE 
is given in exactly the same coefficient form that ND solve and ND solve value take, with a slight exception that you don't have a right hand side F, but a lambda U, where lambda is the eigenvalue. Boundary conditions do not always need to be given. If they're not given, the problem is unconstrained, and if you specify boundary conditions, it's a constrained eigenvalue problem. Here's a simple example. Let's look at the negative Laplacian. To do so, we use the function n the eigensystem minus Laplacian u, u is the dependent variable and x is the spatial coordinate, and in the region of x from 0 to pi, and we'd like to compute four eigenvalues and four eigenvectors. Those are returned in vowels and fonts. The vowels are depicted below, and those are the four eigenvalues computed for this system. Plot shows the visualization of the eigenfunctions. Here's a second example in 2D. Again, we compute the negative Laplacian. U is again the dependent variable, X and Y are the spatial coordinates. This is a constrained eigenvalue problem as we specify a Dirichlet condition and specify that U is supposed to be zero all on the boundary. U is the dependent variable and X and Y are part of a disk and we'd like to compute six eigenvalues and six eigenfunctions. The eigenvalues for this system are shown here and below are plots of the eigenfunctions. Here's an application example where we try to compute the acoustic eigenmodes of a car. For that I've downloaded a picture from Wikipedia. The picture shows a mini which has been cut in half. I use the image processing mask tool to generate a boundary graphics. That is the black picture with the white boundary below. I then use the function bound to discretize graphics of that boundary, which gives me a boundary mesh region. I can directly feed that boundary mesh region to ND eigensystem, and in order to compute the acoustic eigenmodes, I compute the negative Laplacian, the eigensystem of the negative Laplacian. U is the dependent, X and Y are spatial coordinates, and I like to compute six eigenvalues and six eigenfunctions. Next, you see the second eigenmode overlaid over the car. Blue areas are low acoustic pressure and red areas are high acoustic pressure. Let's summarize the capabilities of numeric PDE solving over regions. We can solve PDEs with linear variable coefficients, transient systems, eigensystems, and the PDEs over these arbitrary regions can be in 1D, 2D, and 3D. Thank you very much for attending. We hope you enjoyed it.